work through them though. Uh, Margo and Ashton, it appears that uh, she's having connection issues and she keeps rejoining the conference. Uh, previously, I had it set so that when anyone joined the conference, they would not have the ability to unmute themselves. And of course, they're not instantly co host. Uh, so uh, I've changed that setting um, so that when she does rejoin, she can unmute herself and we'll be able to hear her. Uh, but one of her entries into this meeting is designated as co-host and one is not. I don't think that really affects things. It may affect things on her end, um, but it doesn't affect things on our end. That's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, has she sent uh, her PowerPoint to anyone? Maybe Margot could run the PowerPoint or share it um, so it doesn't keep going down. She said that it was uh, way too large of a file to email. Um, so, hmm. yeah, we don't have it. Okay. How about while we have everyone here and Gabby is working on her connection stuff, I'm going to go ahead and play our next pre recorded session now. Um, and I'll also still play it at the time it was designated for, but that way Gabby has some time and Margo, you might be able to figure out a way to potentially get that PowerPoint. Um, there are a couple different services that we could use to get it over here, but I will play our next pre recorded session that way we are not all sitting in silence together, um, although that is a great bonding moment. So I am going to go ahead and share this and it's about 20 minutes long and then we'll just let Gabby's session run a little bit longer into that pre-recorded session time slot. So I'm going to share my screen with all y'all and we will watch that. Hello from Indonesia. My name is Rahayu Oktaviani and I'm a project manager in Jafan Gibbon Research and Conservation Project, which is working to conserve one of the endangered primate species. And today I would like to share a bit about our works on the ground and also share about the how pandemic impacted the primate conservation organization in Indonesia. So let me start with the Gibbon distribution itself in Asia. So about 20 gibbon species live in Asia, ranging from India, China to Southeast Asia. And in Indonesia itself, none species are inhabit the three main islands. The first four species can be found in Sumatra, another four in Borneo, and one species is still survived in one of the most densely populated island on earth over here. And that species is called the Javan gibbon or silvery gibbon. So same as like the other gibbon species, Japan gibbon is listed as the endangered on the IUCN red list because of the habitat loss and also the illegal threat to keep the baby as pet. And in fact, um, Japan gibbon is one of the popular primate species to sell in social media. And in the term of the ecology, so Japan gibbon is uh, spend their time mostly in the canopy as arboreal species live in the pair with the social monogamy system and they are the fruit eaters of the frugivore. They are also highly territorial that usually shown by produce a song from the female. And Japan Gibbon is one of the two species um, who do not do the duet between female and male beside the Hylobates glossy in Mentawai Island in Asia. And it's not complete uh, to describe about this amazing species without hearing their beautiful song. So let's hear it. So 
So that's the great call from the uh, female of the Japan Gibbon. And if you talk again about the threats for the Japan Gibbon, like the habit of loss and also the forest that keeps shrinking in Java, let's take a look at this picture. So this is Java Island. With only 10% of the original rainforests are still remaining, and Japan Gibbons are only living in the western to the central part of the island. While here, if you see the red uh, borders over here, that's the forest pitches that already fragmented as the Japan Gibbons habitat. And here, our project takes place in one of the last harbor of the wild population of Japan Gibbon in West Java. And it's called as the Gunung Halimun Salak National Park in West Java. And our site itself is located uh, in the one forest that called Chitalahap Forest in the heart of this, of this national park, a stunning sub mountain forest as home for many endangered species besides the Japan gibbon, such as the Japan leopard, the leaf monkey, slower race, hawk eagle, and many more. And it has the boundary with the village, the agricultural land, and also the tea plantation that could be a potential risk in the future that can give pressure to the habitat unless we're working closely with the community and involve them in the conservation effort to gather the supports. Because of that, we developed three main programs to support the conservation of the Javan Gibbon, drug behavior and ecological research, the conservation education program, and also the community engagement collaborate with the local community. We also collaborate with the National Park Authority to support them by the um, provide the baseline data about the Javan Gibbon that can be used for population management plan in this national park and hopefully to other regions. And we also develop the capacity building about the monitoring method that we expect this activity can be adopted in different area of the Gunung Halimun Salak National Park. And this time I would like to emphasize more to the root of the project, which is the regular monitoring and also the behavioral research of the Japan Gibbon. And our project is actually the long term research that has been conducted since 2007, initiated by the Ihwa Women's University from South Korea and collaborated with the IPB University in Indonesia. And it's still running until today as one of the longest study for the wild Japan Gibbon population and helping by the trained research assistants as a part of the local community members we conducted the research while we also assisting the national park to secure the habitat and until now we are following three habitated three groups um, in the daily basis we call them as the group a over here the group b in the middle and also the group s and actually, as a good news that um, I revealed for the first time, a new member just born in the group as this month, make it a total 15 individuals to be monitored. And to give the context about the home range for these three groups, group A, group B, and also the group S have the overlapping home range area in Chitalha Forest. And with the average um, home range is about 32 hectare, and it's larger if we compare with the Japan Gibbons home range in the lowland area. And while focusing our activity to monitor these three groups, we also recognize more than five groups are living closely with the group A, group B, and the group S. And as one of the long term study result and also collaboration from the primatologists in multi countries, we are currently working on a demographic paper that shows some interesting results related with the lifespan, dispersal age, and also the birth range. Like, for example, this is the picture of the Kim Kim. We call, we call him as Kim Kim. He is the sub adult from the group B, and he dispersed at about nine years old. And before he moved from the natal group, we found he experienced increasing aggression from the same sex adults. And uh, this result show like the observation of the individual primates must be made over many years to understand their behavior. And of course, the long-term research is vital for understanding and also protecting our closest living relatives. However, when the pandemic hit Indonesia in exactly one year ago, it brought us to the situation that we were never prepared for. At a time to minimize the spread of the COVID, the government announced to close the border and other restriction on the movement. 
and it also continue with the closure of the conservation area, including our site in the Gunung Halimunsalab National Park. And we never experienced this kind of situation that leave us with significant impact, such as to stop the research and the monitoring activity abruptly until the further notice from the authority. While we also had to send back the student from the abroad and it gave the big hole on her data collection and also interrupted the long term data collection. And we already have like the conservation education program since 2000 and 2018, but then it had to be stopped as well um, due to the pandemic and it changed all of the plan and funding crisis because many donors stopped the funding and we had to cut off our budget like about almost 40 percent and save it mainly for our field staff and the essential costs because we don't want to sacrifice the local community who, who employed by us and to get the to get like the bigger picture about how actually pandemic impact other organization that related with the primate conservation in Indonesia like us, I distributed um, a brief survey to 13 organization that working with endemic and the wild primates such as orangutan, kibon, macaques, and others on four islands in Indonesia. I asked three main questions like whether the pandemic have positive impact in your work and only 36% agreed with the statement. And then about the negative impact from pandemic, 93% experienced the negative impact of the pandemic to their organizations. And if we are talking about the biosafety protocol, all of on the ground organization understand the risk and following the regulation and protocol to work with non-human primates in the COVID situation and also follow the national regulation as well. And in more detail, the pandemic has positive impact in uh, one organization that work in the region with low COVID cases and they still able to conduct the field activity and they got the benefit um, in less disturbance for data collection because less visitors are coming to the site. And another positive impact was related with the human primate interface, especially in provisioning that commonly happen with macaques. Uh, this is an interesting example shown by the Copenhagen Zoo project in Balura National Park in East Java, where the researchers found the macaque group that used to forage in the tourism site like beach during the lockdown and there's no visitors feeding them, they move to find their own natural food in savanna and also in the secondary forest. And it was a good opportunity actually to have the detailed observation for this kind of the behavior, but it couldn't be done due to limited personal restriction and also the travel restriction during the COVID. And this kind of the example of the behavior change from Mecca could be temporary unless the government, the primatologists, and also the organization take action to promote more permanent change to develop a regulation and also to increase public awareness about the risk of zoonosis. That's also one of the positive impact. The second impact, the second positive impact um, felt by the summer organization that awareness about the risk of zoonosis is rising, especially for the field staff and also for the local community. While um, there is opportunity to improve the human and primate interface during the COVID, the challenge and negative impact experienced by 13 primate conservation organizations who joined the survey. Um, the survey results show five main negative impact facing by primate conservation organization. Start from the postpone or like the cancellation of the research activity, the new project as well, especially the ones that related with the community meeting and also difficulty for mobilization for rescue or like for the evacuation due to travel restriction for some organization that working um, in the evacuation process for the primates and in the conflict between human and primates. And for some organization that rely on the volunteers overseas as well as the researchers to help the project financially and extend the research, the pandemic has slowed it down. And funding crisis is a big problem for almost all of the organization because of the budget cutting and money donors are struggling financially while the grant application also got delayed. 
and sad least and said least some organization had to reduce the amount of field staff and the wildlife poaching is rising due to the unguarded area and last year the IUCN SSC primate specialist group has released an advisory for organization work with primates both in wild and captivity setting during the COVID and it was applied with all organizations participated in our survey and uh, like wearing mask clothing yeah using the wearing the clean clothing and disinfected work sites frequently and also wear the PPE during rescue and evacuation conduct the test uh, frequently for all field staff and quarantine is a must for, um, for the staff that coming from other regions and this is the most important thing to keep the distance with the non-human primates and this uh, this year the government the Indonesian government are distributing the vaccine and hopefully we can get it soon especially for the field staff in the remote area and in our organization itself when our site was closed the local community members who depend um, to the income from the research activity got the negative impact uh, in their livelihood and we don't want to keep it longer so in may 2020 um, we discussed with the national park authority to 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 give the permit for our local team that basically they're living in the village and didn't go anywhere to be able to check the coupon once a week so even though um, we couldn't uh, collect the data and they also help uh, the national park authority to prevent Ill illegal activities in the park and still secure the earning and in august 2020 when the government released the statement of um, limited opening of several national parks we adapted the new protocol and we were really grateful with the support from the national park authority and this year collaborated with our university partners in korea and indonesia we're still able to continue the data collection needed by the students overseas who couldn't continue the research and back to the site um, by one method by train the local researchers transfer knowledge and met the agreement for joint publication all of these steps is not only consider the safety of the primates and researchers but also the safeguard um, the health and economic impact on the local staffs and their families as we work closely with the local community we are responsible to prevent a disease transmission and protect the community so last year we distributed about more than 100 reusable masks and also the um, hand was soap from the uh, proceed of selling our merchandise it also gave us opportunity to raise awareness about the good sanitation the risk of zoonosis to the entire village through the poster distribution and another necessary thing is to educate the young generation because when the school closed and we couldn't continue our regular conservation program we shifted the approach by developing books related with the uh, coronavirus and also other education materials about the wildlife that can read and do learn by the, by the children from home. And we also take the opportunity to maximize the use of the social media for science communication to reach more people and also to mainstreaming conservation and the Japan Gibbon because as we know during the lockdown people are glued to their phones and check out uh, the social media openly and we use this opportunity to spread the messages so um, finally the pandemic has prompted us to develop a new protocol and system that work not only for the safety of primates we're working with but also with the local community and the partnership between the organization even though we are still in the surviving mode due to the funding uh, efficiency but we realize it is necessary to strengthen the collaboration with all stakeholders involved in the primate conservation on the ground to tackle illegal activities and the problematic human primate interface in the aspect of the research and the field work it is important to acknowledge and invest to build the capacity of the local researchers and also the local community as part of the conservation effort to be able uh, for the research to be sustained and also we have to communicate effectively collaborate to break the research knowledge gaps and do joint publication to leave the parachute science behind 
and the one health approach is also important to be shared widely to the community surrounding the primate organization because the one health approach seems like it's just like a jargon at the first and the definition is still in, in like in the ivory tower especially in our country so it's really necessary to spread the words and apply it in our workplace and at the end um I would like to thank to all of our partners, our collaborators, and the donors who keep supporting us to continue working to conserve, conserve the last small ape from Java. We might in the crisis, and we are not the one, and we won't give up. So um, thank you for listening to my presentation. Please let me know if you have any question by, um, by, uh, by visiting our, our, our social media or website. So thank you. All right, Margo, I'm going to hand it back over to you all to take over. Great, thank you, Ashton. All right, so we are back on our regular schedule. So hello and welcome everyone to the Global Primatology Virtual Conference hosted by Central Washington University. My name is Margo Hinge, and I will be moderating this session. So this session is with Gabriella Scholar, Director of the Gibbon Conservation Center and well, was supposed to go until 2.30, we might end up going over, we'll see. Um, so before we start, I do want to note, well, <laughs> this, is being this session is being recorded. Uh, it has been recorded for a while. I did not get to make this uh, announcement earlier. If you do not want to be recorded, then make sure to turn off your camera. Um, additionally, to make this a fun and enjoyable learning experience for everyone involved, I am going to request that we all follow a few session rules. Um, so let's try to only have one person speak at a time. Let's uh, be respectful. Everyone is encouraged to ask, uh, to participate and ask questions. Um, however, due to time constraints, we might have to limit uh, each participant to only one question um, and then uh, avoid speaking on behalf of others. Do not be insulting or you may be expelled from the session. And then finally, let's try to keep the chat clear of traffic and only use it for questions. So now that we are all on the same page, it is time for me to introduce Gabby, who, as I said, is the director of the Gibbon Conservation Center, which is currently located in Santa Clarita in California. Um, so a little bit of information about the GCC and Gabby. Um, so the mission of a GCC is to promote the conservation, study, and care of gibbons through public education and habitat preservation. The GCC houses 37 gibbons, representing five of the 20 species, one of which is critically endangered. Uh, Gabby is an active participant in the gibbon zoolo zoological conservation and scientific communities worldwide. As the SSA Zoo Liaison at the International Union for Conservation of Nature a Primate Specialist Group, she is responsible for representing the SSA within the zoo community and improving links between in situ and ex situ conservation. She's also a husbandry advisor for the, for the Gibbon SSP in the USA, as well as a member of the Gibbon Henry Ring and Surrogate team. So without further ado, Gabby, you can take it away. Uh Thank you for the introduction and uh, for inviting me to talk here. Um, I'm actually at the center since I live on site and uh, I don't have very good uh, internet signal inside the house and in the office. So I'm actually sitting outside and it's afternoon. That means the gibbons more like quiet during the presentation unless they see an eagle or something. So uh, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and I'm gonna start the PowerPoint presentation and hopefully I won't have more difficulties. So. Is it, okay, it's sharing. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, um, my career is started um, with animals and nature at very early age. I just loved being outside and uh, since I was a toddler, I was just um, 
examining the ground and insects. I loved hiking. And uh, that's what my parents are really supported me to um, kind of continue doing that. And um, when I finished high school, I went to study biology in Hungary. And um, when I was um, uh, summer breaks, I worked at the uh, Budapest Zoo and I also studied observing gibbons. Uh, at the zoo, and this is where I met uh, the gibbon, uh, Kossat, who was a young uh, northern white cheek gibbon. And um, I started, you know, spending time recording his vocalizations, and um, that also led me to start working with my um, advisor, uh, Dr. Maria Uihei, who was. Um, Gibbon, and uh, we started working together, uh, visiting different zoos in Hungary, um, and uh, started uh, doing self recognition experiments and other cognitive studies uh, to get a deeper understanding on uh, Gibbon uh, behavior and, and intelligence. And Maria was also the same person who told me about the Gibbon. So after I graduated, I came to the US and started volunteering at the Gibbon Center in Santa Clarita. You mentioned our mission, so I just kind of um, skipped that. But the center was started in 1976 um, by Alan Mutnik. And um, Alan was just a very passionate person. He actually never finished college, uh, but he was. Um, just had so much knowledge um, about Gibbons, um, and uh, he published many scientific papers. He visited different zoos and sanctuaries all over the world and taught people about Gibbons, how to recognize the individual species, how to care for them. And um, he was a very inspiring person, so I was very lucky to work with him. Um, he established the center in 1976, and uh, several years later, the center became a nonprofit uh, organization. Uh, today, we participate in uh, different captive breeding programs for uh, five species of gibbons. Uh, we educate people about gibbons. Um, uh, we invite students and scientists to study gibbons here, and um, as the husbandry advisor, I'm also. Uh, advise other zoos and sanctuaries about uh, given husbandry. And um, so we try to collaborate with uh, different zoos and uh, other organizations worldwide. Um, here you can see Alan uh, in an enclosure with one of the given in these uh, early years in his 30s. Uh, he also gave uh, lead tours at the center, and um, he was uh, just a lot of fun to work with him. Uh, anyone who works at the center, you know, started as volunteers, and we worked. Uh, the many other people worked with him together on building enclosures and um, uh, studying the gibbons. He also gave me a chance to. Uh, Meet other primatologists. Here you can see us uh, with Ardit Judith. And uh, these are also inspired me to continue in this field, uh, studying Gibbons and uh, lead the, the Gibbons Center. So today we have uh, 30 Gibbons on site, uh, five different species. Uh, we have uh, Pileated Gibbons, uh, Devon Gibbons, Eastern Hula Gibbons, Northern Waiichi Gibbons, and uh, Siamon. Uh, having so many different species and uh, a large collection of animals on the same site is allow us to uh, compare their behaviors, to study uh, family structures, uh, other um, social behaviors, to compare different species. So it's just a great opportunity to visit and also to spend time here and study them. Uh, but why the why? to establish a center so focused on one species, one uh, group of uh, primates, and um, why studying gibbons? Um, 
we know that they are endangered and uh, they are uh, interesting in their own right, but we also know that they are the first uh, apes that evolved sometimes around 70 million years ago, and we still share a large number, 96% uh, of our DNA. So uh, just by studying gibbons, we can learn about ourselves and how we evolve humans. Um, as I mentioned, we participate in non-invasive studies. Uh, I don't want you to read this fourth poster, uh, but this is something that we participated. So every time we do a routine checkup at the center, we collect blood samples and send it to a scientist studying genetics. And uh, Dr. Lucia Carbona was able to um, uh, receive um, blood samples from a northern white chick given called Asia. And um, they were able to decode the given genome by using uh, the blood samples from us. Uh, another interesting thing that one of our uh, uh, given also made it to the uh, cover of the Nature when they published their findings. Um, there's other interesting things. So we know there is 20 different species of gibbons, and um, they belong to four different genera. And at the center, we are lucky to have uh, species from all four genera. So uh, with the same uh, routine checkups, we were able to send samples from the different species, and they were able to do studies to study how the different genus evolved sometimes around four or five million years ago. And uh, we continue participating with different research uh, with um, Lucia and her lab. And, um, Again, we learned other new interesting things about gibbons and their uh, chromosomes. How, for some reason, they are uh, more unique uh, than other um, animals' genome. They uh, feature a very high rate of chromosomal uh, rearrangements uh, that happens when there is uh, during evolution, but it can also happen uh, during cancer, during a disease. So um, we can uh, learn something that we can use for uh, human studies. Um, and this is all non-invasive because we only send samples when we actually already doing a checkup on a given. And of course, we also had students from uh, Central Washington uh, University um, did uh, different social behavior communication studies um, like Caroline uh, spent here a couple of weeks uh, just practicing uh, recording gibbons. Uh, we also had um, Kelly who studied uh, what the visitors have any effect on the gibbons. And uh, we want to continue collaborating with uh, the students from uh, your school. Um, another uh, collaboration between the Western University and the Gibbon Center. Um, Last summer, we had researchers doing uh, enrichment. Uh, here, they were giving a puzzle feeder to the gibbons, and they had different difficulties, and they were collecting data um, on how easily they can solve the problem. And there's another project at the same time that they're giving the gibbons and um, MP3 players that they had to push different buttons to able to. Um, if they want to participate to listen different soundtracks, music or other uh, uh, animal sounds or uh, traffic sounds. And um, unfortunately, the gibbons were not as interested. Uh, we only had one gibbon. They were actually uh, more willing to participate in that study. Um, but there's other things that they, uh, like to interrupt such as a touch screen. See if this will play. Here, uh, Eastern Hula Gibbon is holding a phone and uh, trying to uh, manipulate it. There's several different uh, applications for human children for toddlers, and um, some Gibbons are interested in, and they want to play with that. I don't have very good connections, so I'm not sure that played very well, but happy to share it after the presentation. 
see if this will play a little bit better. So Q is uh, same Eastern Hula given, just kind of scrolling. Again, uh, I can show you this later. Um, so some of the given characteristics that uh, I want to talk about, um, they naturally walk upright. Uh, if they go on the ground in the wild, they hardly ever do that, but here you can observe that um, if they are on the ground standing or walking. Their other natural locomotion is their uh, well known uh, brush eating uh, movement. Let me see if I can show you here uh, slow motion walking. Uh, this is also an ordinary uh, white given a female just. Kind of walking across the bamboo. Here, uh, also in the captive settings in the exhibit, uh, kind of using both the arms and the ropes, uh, both kind of swinging and walking upright. Um, here you can see just the shot of the actual brachiating movement. And here is this word play. So our enclosures can exit that we should try to fill up uh, with branches and swings so they can uh, move around the trolley and utilize the whole space. That's a chicken, a uh, very acrobatic man. And spinning around the branches. Um, at the center, we try to keep family groups uh, together. We also have pairs that are non breeding, um, uh, but we know their gestation period is around six and a half months. Uh, they usually have single births and they can start reproducing around eight to ten years of age. Uh, the infant nurse uh, until two, two and a half years of age. And here you can see a newborn infant with the mother. That the mother is just kind of uh, cleaning the infant. Uh, they, when they're born, they are almost hairless. And uh, here you can just see the little foot sticking out. And uh, again, here you see the uh, mother affiliated given with the newborn infant nursing. And here you can see a couple months old starting to get uh, some independence and start leaving the mother. So the first two, three months, they just breastfeed. And at around uh, three, four months of age, they start uh, leaving the mother and start uh, climbing and practicing. Of course, the mother stay very close to them and assist if they need any help. Uh, here again, the same female just grooming the infant, couple months old. And um, uh, same female with the infant and the older sibling. So what's uh, unique at the center that uh, we can have the family groups to pair the different species and you can actually study interactions and uh, bonding uh, within the family and observe them very closely. And um, here you can uh, have, you can see the older uh, sibling just grooming the infant. Here also mother, infant, and the slightly older offspring. So we also know gibbons are serial monogamous. Uh, mentioned they live in family groups and in the wild, um, or they are very territorial. Uh, here at the center, we have uh, 16 groups they're not all family, so they are also pairs, and we have to give them visual privacy uh, to to make sure they tolerate each other and they don't uh, upset each other. Uh, 
this is a video uh, of, uh, again, the family of a northern white chick gibbon. This little infant is about uh, four months old, eating some solid food already. Um, Another interesting thing you see here, the adult male and the infant sharing food, and the mother is also eating. Um, Northern white chick gibbons and many other species of gibbons have different colors for male and a female. That's called sexual dichromatism. And uh, here the infant born the same color as the mother, and then they slowly start changing color to uh, black. Here the mother is grooming the father, just the normal social behavior. Spend a lot of time grooming. Here the infant is nursing. So this is a, a young female that's showing the color change. Eventually she will turn black. And then when she's around six and a half, seven, she will change color a second time and turn back to uh, blonde or orange color, the adult female color. So the family stay very close to each other. Uh, they're very closely bonded. And both the mother and the father participate raising the offspring. So again, it's just another study that could be interesting to study the father's involvement uh, with the raising the offspring. Pierre here is the adult male, he's a first time father. And uh, um, first few weeks he was kind of shy. And then uh, now he's very much involved and spend a lot of time playing with the offspring, uh, sharing food with the offspring. And then once the female will have another offspring, most likely uh, this young female will start sleeping at night, the father. Here the, the little girl is grooming the mom. And that's the adult male here playing. And they can play very rough. Uh, this is kind of a joke, but it's actually true. Um, so very often uh, between given couples or within the family, the adult female is dominant and they tend to be the one to take the food first and we have to make sure that both uh, adults receive the same amount so they share. Um, and here you can see examples of the like paternal care, um, the father gently touching the newborn infant, they share food with them, um, sometimes even holding them. It's more known for Siamang, uh, the adult male uh, after age year and a half, two years old, sometimes carry the infant when it's getting too heavy for the mother to carry the infant, but it's in captivity it's been seen with other species of gibbons. Here again, you see the mother and the young infant uh, interacting with the older siblings. And all the older siblings also known to sometimes carry the offspring. And they spend a lot of time playing. You can see here siblings interacting and playing uh, with each other on the swing. Um, here you can see some uh, grooming behavior with the mother and the offspring and the younger one come by also two offspring. <laughs> so these social interactions you can record at the center very closely and uh, also um, collect uh, behavior notes. Um, what's my main interest, but again, something that, that you, you can um, study at the center, 
um, is their vocalization, their communication. Uh, Gibbons use both vocal and gestural and facial uh, communications. Um, Gibbons song can be easily studied in the wild, but certain vocalizations are very quiet and you have to, uh, it's more easy, it's easier to study them in a captive settings. So I'm just gonna play, I uh, hope you will hear it, um, a couple of different sounds. So this is the morning song that happens every morning at sunrise at the center. And one given start and then uh, the family joins in with that uh, individual and then uh, other given family. So it's become like a collaboration between the different groups, uh, become like kind of like a concert. Some groups actually exchange calls with each other and collaborate with each other and other ones just kind of singing around the same time. And having five species, uh, you can open here all five species singing together. Uh, this is a different sound. So here you can hear an infant crying and then the mother was answering for the infant's cry and another Sound, I'm gonna stop it so I can talk. Uh, another sound that you hear um, that makes it a little bit difficult to study Gibbons here that we have uh, different uh, Gibbons calling at the same time. So while I'm trying to record the mother communicating with the infant, there are other Gibbons might be singing. So that that is something that um, it's a little bit difficult sometimes. This one is. Since I'm sitting outside, I won't play this too long, but this is an alarm call, and that's why I'm not playing it. Um, so Gibbons make specific alarms for um, different situations. I don't say for specific predators because that's not exactly true, but definitely they make different sound for uh, a bird, the different alarm, and then things that's on the ground. So that could be a snake or could be a bobcat. Um, or things that they don't really know what it is, but it's scary, uh, like a toad or a raccoon at night. Uh, so they make specific alarm calls, which is also species specific and can be recorded easily at the center. And we can uh, get more understanding about uh, what the different calls they are making. And uh, this next slide will be also a video um, recording of a curated given singing. And uh, again, uh, you can um, actually study them very closely, how they make certain sounds. And what's unique with the with Gibbons, that they make sounds while breathing in and breathing out. So you can see that. And that was also an alarm, so I won't play it again. And this will be a great pool. a duet between the mated pair, uh, Pileated Gibbon and uh, Truman. And um, again, um, we can study them here very closely and record them. And um, what my interest is to study how they develop the duet. So when we introduce two Gibbons, their song, the duet is not as well coordinated but after uh, they've been spending more time, couple months together, they bonded with each other. 
their duet become more coordinated. And facial expression uh, and, um, can be also seen very closely here. You see a low grimace of a young uh, Northern white chick given. Uh, it was a nervous uh, smile. Uh, the male, uh, the mother and the infant was recently just reintroduced to the rest of the family. So he was just a little bit nervous around the, the adult male. And this is a play face. Um, uh, given youngsters, especially are very playful and they do have this very uh, specific facial expression when they are playing. Uh, this is an adult male uh, with also a play face. He got a new swing and as a, you know, enrichment and uh, he's having a great time. Uh, the shows are big canines. This is a pileated female. She's, she's actually yawning, but there is a similar facial expression, not as wide open mass, but um, the open mass track when they use food as a aggression. Uh, just a little bit, um, just still given characteristics, uh, the diet in the wild, it contains fruits, uh, young leaves, insects, uh, sometimes they catch birds and they eat the eggs if they find it in a nest. Um, at the center, we provide um, six to eight uh, feedings a day and uh, a very variable diet uh, includes different fruits and vegetables, uh, leaves, uh, different greens nuts and seeds, hard boiled eggs, um, sometimes cooked chicken. So, uh, mentioned that there's 20 species and there's four different genera. Um, and at the center, we have species from all four genera. We know they are uh, protected in each country, um, but in, um, in all spaces, the numbers is declining. So another reason to have a center here um, to tell this to people and um, try to uh, make some changes in their behavior. The biggest threats uh, for gibbons is deforestation from um, illegal logging, uh, cutting down the trees for plantation, cafe tea plantation, palm oil plantations for mining, uh, power lines, and um, climate change also affecting uh, gibbons. Small population size for certain species like the hen and gibbon is down to like 30 individuals. But other populations like uh, we have the northern white chick gibbons that is a SSP species, it's, it's just less than 1,000 left in the wild. And it's also hunting, hunting for their meat, uh, but also for using them as a collection, so the trophy, or using them during medication. Um, uh, different ceremonies or as a traditional medication. And unfortunately also for the wildlife trade, uh, using them as a pet. Um, unfortunately, you can see that um, when you travel and as well on social media sites that you can see people posing with gibbons and other primates, wild animals. It's never a good idea and we try to um, tell people when we see that. Um, that um, and try to ask questions where those individual gibbons were located because we do have partners in the field that could get help for these uh, pet gibbons. Um, there's uh, many different centers, so definitely you are not the only one uh, in the U.S. and uh, in the world that worked with gibbons. And I was very lucky to visit centers in Asia. Uh, this and conservation centers that um, we all work together to try to preserve gibbons. And um, they work with the local children, educate people about gibbons. And um, it was great to visit a center in Java and actually go with them to the schools. And the kids were so excited um, to be part of the program and, and hear about gibbons. And again, if it's something uh, you want to do, you can reach out to us and we can send you uh, contacts to these uh, organizations if you want to participate in that program. Um, there are sanctuaries also in Java to rescue gibbons from the wildlife trade. And um, you can see here a very um, 
large uh, open air enclosures where the gibbons can again utilize the space and learn um, to move around naturally. And eventually these gibbons are going to be released uh, back into the wild if they are healthy physically and uh, mentally. Um, this is a Javan gibbon with the offspring at the sanctuary. And they have these giant bamboo structures that they can just move around and brachiate and gain their strength back. Very often when they rescue gibbons from the wildlife trade, those gibbons kept in tiny cages, uh, sometimes in a bird cage. So this is a important first step before they release them back into the wild so they can uh, exercise and move around. Uh, here I was visiting a center in Northeast India and just doing uh, a little checkup on the uh, young uh, Western who was given. And, uh, but um, there are things that you can also do at home um, to help gibbons and other wildlife living in the rainforest. Um, look into where your product that you buy in a store came from, how it was produced, and try to buy um, sustainable produce uh, items. Uh, try to reduce palm oil use and read the ingredients, um, recycle and reuse things. And just in general, try to reduce your footprint. And when things can go back, uh, when we can start traveling again after this pandemic, um, if we get a chance and you're visiting other sites, um, don't take uh, pictures with the wildlife during your travels. And another things you can always do, you can volunteer and um, you can uh, work with us or work with another organization. We always need more volunteers and uh, interns, and um, you can assist us in our conservation program, education program. Uh, you can create enrichment for the gibbons here. You can see we're making uh, using banana leaves and give um, um, enrichment for the gibbons, food enrichment. Uh, here too, uh, Tiffan is making um, uh, food enrichment. Uh, some special uh, treats are wrapped into uh, either banana leaves or grape leaves. And then we'll feed it out. Uh, you can camp on site and we are actually moving to a new location. Um, here in Santa, Cla Santa Clarita, we are on five acres. And um, this year we are moving to Santa Margarita, uh, a new site that will be 25 acres. And we'll be also have site for housing researchers, uh, interns, volunteers. So it will be a great opportunity to study Gibbons at the center. Here you can see a group of volunteers just helping preparing some branches for the enclosures, removing the bark to make it smoother for the Gibbons. And here we are creating enrichment for the gibbons, building enclosures with, again, uh, hard work, but it is uh, something you can really make a difference and work with us. And we train you how to do such things. Here we are putting in the branches for the enclosures um, and always uh, trimming the trees and uh, doing fire clearance. And um, thank you so much. Uh, uh, that was the end of the presentation. And now, if you have any questions, let me know. And I will stop sharing. <laughs> thank you, Gabby. Um, so if anyone has questions, you can raise your hand if you feel comfortable um, just saying your questions verbally, or you can use the chat and I will relay the questions for you. If somebody has questions, they can also email us. Um, if somebody wants to volunteer or intern or wants to develop a research project, they can reach out us in an email. Um, so we have someone raising their hand. You should be able to talk now. Yeah. I 
I read a question if we are taking volunteers at this time. Uh, we are slowly opening. Uh, we open for visitors and as soon as the staff is vaccinated, we'll start taking volunteers again. Uh, at this location, we have only uh, one spot for uh, living on site, uh, but from the summer, from July, we'll have on-site housing for two, three, maybe up to four uh, researchers. Oh. Hey, Gabriela. Uh, yes. Am I audible? Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Thank you so yes. much for such uh, such an uh, enlightening talk. Thank so you. I just, uh, I just have one question. As far as I uh, know about gibbons, uh, mm -hmm. they have large. They uh, they live in large ter uh, territories and big family groups. Mm -hmm. So as as I saw in the pictures, uh, the the cages are very very confined although it's very comforting and you are trying your best to enrich them with good nutrition but yeah uh, are you uh, or the center uh, is the center working about something about expanding the territory of it because uh, as far as i'm concerned uh, uh, gibbons gibbons are highly territorial they 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 like to swing uh, freely around the jungle and all so in my opinion it's it's putting a kind of a stress on, uh, if if they have a less area to range around. So, uh, are you planning to expand it or do something about it? Yes. Because, so yeah. Yeah. So let me answer you. Um, so here at the conservation center in Santa Clarita, we are on five acre, and uh, we started enlarging some of the enclosures, but we we had to kind of keep the same footprint to able to you know fit it. Uh, so, 1 of the reason we are moving to another site, uh, so we can expand that enclosures and, um. So, the new site has 26 acres and we can enlarge the given enclosures. So, uh, we're going to give a bigger footprint to the gibbons, but also give height. Uh, so they can have more space, uh, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for answering this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we have more questions in the chat. Uh, Marilyn is asking, do all your animals remain in the sanctuary or, or are any of your breeding programs meant to also be taken back and released? Um, so we never released any gibbons from the center, but there is a program, um, in Java and they already released some captive born gibbons and uh, we would like to participate in that program. We have one uh, Javan gibbon that is uh, a candidate to be uh, part of it and eventually sent back to Java. Uh, that doesn't mean he's going to be for sure released back into the wild, uh, but the plan is to send him to one of the sanctuary in Java and pair him up with a female. And if they seem to be fit to be released back into the wild, they're gonna move them to a release site. Uh, they're doing soak treaties. So they, uh, what they do, they continue feeding them and uh, see if they uh, eventually leave the release site and become independent uh, from people. They don't have to feed them anymore. So uh, he's gonna be the first one that we're gonna try to release and, um, Maybe at some point we can also participate in a program for pileated gibbons. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, somebody is raising their hand. Have a quick question. So you mentioned that um, of all of the the species, there were two that don't participate in duets. Um, I love given calls. I'm like obsessed with them. So I'm just kind of curious, like, what's the thought behind like why those two species actually don't duet with each other? Um, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, the two species that doesn't sing a duet is one is the Javan gibbon and the other one is the classic gibbon. Both are kind of uh, separated on an island uh, and they don't have other gibbons near them. So um, not sure it has anything to do with it, but um, that's all I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yes, I'm not sure. Uh, what's interesting that at the center we had, um, at some point we had a, um, a young Javan female house with a Arja Gibbon. Arja Gibbon sing a duet song and uh, the two were duetting with each other, but they were juveniles and we don't want to keep them together uh, once they were older because we don't want them to hybridize. So, um, it's something with the the male Javan Gibbon that it just doesn't sing a duet um, with the female. There are times like when there's an alarm situation that they are calling together. Uh, they just don't seem to coordinate the actual song parts. They just calling around the same time. Uh, Ashton is asking, are there any research topics that you are hoping will be conducted at the GCC? Um, I think there could be some um, opportunities to study play behavior, uh, siblings interactions, paternal care. Um, definitely we can do more enrichment uh, projects, how the Gibbons uh, react to it. Um, my interest is vocalization, so sometimes people want to study different uh, vocal behavior, but if it's overlap with my study, then uh, it's, it can get um, kind of restrictive what they can actually record. But definitely there are research uh, in relation to vocalization can be also conducted here. Any other okay. questions? Well, I guess I have a question myself. Um, so I was wondering with the move, like what stage are you at and like how, like how is the process, what is the process like of like getting the place ready to move? Okay. So we are in escrow and the escrow closing on April 13. Uh, we are at the same time also started the permit process to have animals in any location. You have to get specific permits because these are exotic wild animals. Uh, here we are, op um, we have permits with the USDA. Uh, we have California and US Fish and Wildlife permits and those permits will come with us. But we also have to get a permit from the county to able to have a center there. So we're working on that. And once we get the permits, we have to put up a perimeter fence um, to make sure that the animals are safe. Nobody can come just, you know, come through the, the entrance. Um, and then uh, once we have that, we can start uh, transferring the animals. The first step um, will be just to move these enclosures at the new location. We have one complete new set enclosure, uh, which kind of gonna be an, like an example enclosure, what we want to have at, for all the gibbons. It's gonna be 18 feet tall instead of what we have here, 12, 14 feet tall enclosures. And um, so we'll set up that new enclosure and then we move the gibbons. To move the gibbons, of course, we have to tranquilize them. We're gonna do a routine checkup on uh, each gibbon and then we'll transfer them in a crate. Uh, they will travel in a crate. And um, we're gonna try to do maybe two enclosure at the same time. Uh, to do this, we'll have to uh, organize volunteer groups that can assist us taking down the enclosure and uh, transferring them and setting up at the new site. Thank so you. a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Ashton is asking, what is the local community interest like in regards to the GCC? Uh, the new community or here? <laughs> Either. Uh, right. So uh, we've been here for uh, almost 40 years, right? So uh, we, most people know we are here. Um, the actual city is not much involved. We we used to, you know, we can get a, a grant like every other year uh, from the city of Santa Clarita. And um, when we first opened to the general public, it, it took some time to actually get visitors. But many local schools and colleges already know we were here. 
So, uh, but the general public didn't really know us. So that that took some time. Um, we we learned from that, and as we going to move to a new location, we already try to reach out to the community so they know we're going to be there, and um, we need the the general public and also students uh, to able to operate and uh, raise uh, one of some of our income uh, coming from visitors. So uh, we're working on that to to be welcome at the new place. I guess just quickly uh, piggybacking off of that, um, mm -hmm. have people ever complained about the calls? I personally would love to wake up every day with given calls, but I was just curious whether that had been an issue. Um, not really, not really. So uh, nice. the neighbors that we have here, they moved here after us. So uh, now we are moving to a new place. Uh, as we were looking for a piece of land, we were trying to look for a place that doesn't have too many neighbors. So um, I love the given singing. I live on site, the staff living on site. So, but not everybody wants to hear them at 5.30 in the morning. Right, <laughs> you can right. sleep through it in like 10 years. Um, Jenna is saying, I don't know a lot about Gibbons, so I apologize in advance, but how do you feel about Gibbons being housed individually in zoos? Is that okay for their species? Um, so it's sometimes it's just that you don't have an option. So we do have uh, two males. One is actually not housed completely by himself. He's housed next to his father, uh, but, um, Certain gibbons, there's very few other uh, coptic population is very small and um, you can not put two adult male together. They would fight. Um, so you have to find a female that kind of in the right age to able to introduce them and pair them up. And um, it's, it's better to house them alone that house them with someone that they don't like. And uh, even sometimes when they have like a genetic match between a male and a female, they just don't get along and they fight. So then it's, that can be very stressful for them. So, uh, I mean, if possible, uh, try to pair them up. Uh, the other issue that in zoos and in conservation centers, we want to keep species. Uh, we don't want to hybridize them. And gibbons between different species can hybridize. So that also risk that we put two different species together just so they have a friend, but then they produce an offspring. And then what's going to happen with the offspring? There are natural, there are contraceptive methods that we can use, but those can fail. So you have to be still careful with that. And um, we don't, we want to breed gibbons, but responsibly. So we have species that are not in the breeding program. Those females have contraceptive implant or they are having uh, a contraceptive pill. So either method can work and there's other contraceptive methods, but um, you kind of have to put everything in there and think it through what's the best uh, for the gibbons and then if for the offspring as well. Um, we have another question in the chat. Is there a central repository for the results of studies done at the GCC, um, especially for those that are not ultimately published? Um, definitely, we have like list of studies that has been uh, conducted at the center and we can share that uh, if there is an interest for it. Yeah. Those are all the questions I see in the chat for now. Any other questions or are we going to wrap up soon? We have another question. Uh, uh, Gabriela, I was just <clears throat> sorry. I was just very curious about uh, uh, if you are thinking about releasing animals from that sanctuary, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So do you have any kind of uh, uh, program to do that? Because a sanctuary is a very different uh, setting in which the animal is there. And when you leave the, uh, release the animal into a forest, then it's a totally different setting. So obviously you have to monitor the animals you have released in a in the jungle. So uh, do you have thought about that? Do you, do you have any programs or anything like that which can because uh, me personally, if I was a given and I was in your sanctuary, I would I would love to be there because I'm getting all protected and I'm getting all the food there. Yeah, I won't I won't be leaving it. So uh, okay, yes. So um there is two center in Java that already doing rehabilitation and release gibbons back into the wild. Uh, most of their gibbons that they release were uh, rescued gibbons from the wildlife trade. Um, but the center um, that works with the Ospinal uh, Conservation Center, uh, they started to release some captive born gibbons. Um, and that's the, the program the, we would like to participate first. I also know about the sanctuary in Com uh, Cambodia that has release program for pileated gibbons. Uh, we haven't reached out, but it could be something uh, in the future. Um, they seem to do a second release. So they have pileated gibbons that that's good from the wildlife trade. They breed them at the sanctuary, and that's where we would send one of our pileated gibbons. And they release their offspring, so it's more like a second generation that got the chance to live in a wild. Uh, for Jevan gibbons, they actually releasing captive born gibbons, but they monitor them. Uh, so they following them in the forest, making sure uh, that they are safe. They provide food if it's necessary. Um, they used to give them also GPS implant that would only you know won't work forever, but for the first most sensitive period. First months, uh, they can follow them the gibbons more easily, and of course, they only release gibbons that are physically and mentally healthy. Uh, they show normal gibbon instincts, like the way we selected that one individual, Medina. Um, he doesn't spend time on the ground. That's very important behavior because it's not safe to be on the ground in a rainforest floor for a gibbon. Um, and other behaviors, he's. He's not aggressive towards people, which could be an issue if you really is like an imprinted gibbons that spend a lot of uh, time with humans. They become imprinted to people since they are very territorial animals that gibbon can be very aggressive at the adult age. If you release them in a forest, it can attack the researchers. It can attack the people try to monitor the forest. So it's not a good idea. Uh, but you also don't want to release a gibbon that was hand raised or was just had a lot of human interaction and love people, they too tame. So you have to look at their behavior. Uh, you also don't release most of the time a single gibbon. You wait for them to bond at the sanctuary, pair up with another one, even maybe produce offspring because they can protect their territory together. So uh, that's why it's, it's, it's a program that takes a lot of um, time and effort and funding uh, to do it right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and still on that topic, Marilyn said in the chat that she has volunteered at a sanctuary in Thailand and they mm -hmm. also have a release program there where they do soft releases onto an island first uh, before, I guess, releasing them completely in the forest. All right, well, if there are no other questions, we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much, Gabby, for joining us. This was a really interesting talk. Um, I do want to say that we'll have our final uh, live presentation at uh, three, yes, at 3 p.m. Pacific time. And we will also be uh, re-showing the pre-recorded session that we had earlier um, at 2.30 as scheduled. Oh, and I guess we do have a new question. I saw another I question, yes. <laughs> so uh, are there any plans for breeding hulocks long-term at the GCC or in the US? And how is inbreeding depression avoided? Uh, so, at this point, um, we are not breeding the Eastern Hulok Gibbons here uh, because um, 
we they are not in a global breeding program so there is no real space to send them we do we had breeding in the past so we have a family group with uh, three offspring the older male was uh, already introduced to a female but we contracepted the female so uh, we don't want to inbreed them we also we we believe we have enough unrelated individuals to prevent inbreeding but uh, since there's no space for them um, in other zoos uh, worldwide there's no interest um, also there's no release program and and the country Myanmar um, don't really know what's going on there so um, until there is no release program and um, it's just there's no need to breed them so thank you gabby mm -hmm. yeah thank you so much all right so i think that's time we are done thank you everyone and as i said we have the next session at three and we will be showing again the pre-recorded session at 2 30 in just a few minutes <laughs>